Heavenly Father, as we take up this next topic, we ask that you'd guide and direct in the discussion, that the words would be clear and easy to understand, and that they would glorify you and be truthful and honest. And we thank you for bringing us together at this point in earth's history to consider these things. Now please be with us as we continue on in this series, in Jesus' name, amen. The, the next presentation you find on page 81 in your syllabus, sermon number nine, the indignation. And uh, without a doubt in the Bible, there are two types of indignation. The indignation that uh, is poured out upon those people that totally and forever reject the grace of God. The, um, the third angel's message is a warning against receiving the wrath of God that's poured out without measure and it includes all of God's indignation. So there is an indignation against um, the rejectors of the grace of God that is a theme in Bible prophecy. But there is also an indignation specifically identified against God's covenant people should they choose to reject the covenant, break the covenant. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we are very familiar with the prayer in Daniel 9 of Daniel, and uh, we point to it as a classic of example of our responsibility to identify with the, the abominations that are going on among us, if you're going to use the terminology of Ezekiel 8 and 9, and this is what Daniel did. We have no evidence that Daniel was some type of open sinner, yet as he addressed the issues that had brought that God's indignation upon his people, he identified himself with it. And that's a worthy understanding from Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. And you'll notice in your notes, we start with Daniel's prayer, verses 2 through 23. But what I would hope you'd look at here in page 81, in Daniel's prayer, which we, this is, that's all set forth for us. If you look at the fourth paragraph, um, there's two points there that I want to, or two verses that I want to emphasize. The fourth paragraph begins, To the Lord our God belong with mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel hath transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his word, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done, as hath been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses. In the writings of Moses, and this is, uh, I hope we can see, this is specifically what Daniel's referencing in his prayer. In the writings of Moses, there are several passages where he sets forth for Israel the opportunity to receive blessings if they would have kept and obeyed the covenant or cursings if they broke the covenant. And this is what Daniel is referencing as he's having this classic prayer in Daniel 9. He's, he's being very specific that what has been brought upon Jerusalem and Judah and Israel is the curse that has been set forth by Moses. And, and there's more than one place where you will find this curse. And this curse that is against God's people for breaking the covenant is also expre it's expressed in a variety of ways in the Old Testament. Um, sometimes you can the writers will talk about Israel being scattered because of their disobedience. So there's a, a theme of the scattering that took place because of God's indignation. God's indignation is another term that is used for this curse. The curse is another one. So on page 82, you'll see a passage from Deuteronomy uh, 29, verse 27 through 29. And it's talking about the curses that are written in the book. It says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in the book. This is what Daniel had been referring to. 
And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation. His indignation was against Israel and cast them into another land. His indignation is the scattering. Now, there are two, there are three terms that are all associated to the same thing. The curse, the indignation, the scattering. We're dealing with the indignation here kind of as our theme initially, but don't forget that in early writings where Sister White makes this statement endorsing this chart and the pioneer position on the daily, there's two paragraphs where she makes these, this endorsement. The first paragraph where she says this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, the first two-thirds of that paragraph, she's talking about the scattering and the gathering. So when you're reading the curse of Moses in the Bible, um, the indignation of God against his people in the Bible, understand you're reading about the scattering of his people and understand this is what Sister White was speaking about in early writings when she was pointing to this chart as being directed by the hand of the Lord. There is a connection there. Um, anyway, Deuteronomy 29, 27 through 29 says, And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is written this day. And this is the next verse is a verse that we're all familiar with, but I want to submit to you that when you look at it in context, you realize that one of the secret things in the Bible that evidently he reveals to us has to do with the indignation, the scattering. And of course, it's the 2520 that has to do with the indignation and the scattering. And verse 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And brothers and sisters, that verse is very common, but it wasn't for me, at least until here recently, that I realized that that promise about the secret things being revealed to us and then they belong to us is in the context of the scattering and the gathering and God's indignation against his people. It's in the context of the 2520. Um, so anyway, in the... We're going to look at just a couple more places where God's indignation is identified. And in Lamentations 2, 1 through 9, um, it says, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud and his anger, and cast down from heaven unto earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger? Uh, if you drop down to the sixth paragraph there, where you see the indignation of his anger uh, in bold face, it says, And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle, as if it were a garden. He hath destroyed his places of the assembly. The Lord hath caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion, and hath despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest, in the indignation of his anger against his people because they chose not to obey the covenant. Every place you find the curse of Moses against, written out, against God's people because of their unwillingness to obey the covenant, it is always begins with a list of promised blessings. If you, if you keep the covenant, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. You will be blessed. But if you break the covenant, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be cursed. You're going to be cursed. Um, in between the last meeting and this meeting, a question came up about the blessing. I mean, when you look very closely at it, at this theme, one of the things that you understand is a kind of a, a more of a theoretical argument, but I know that it's spot on. It, it, it just, it's right on. It's that in the two 2520s, which we're going to begin to look at, the one came to a conclusion in 1798 and was emphasizing the scattering of God's people, and the second 2520 against the southern kingdom came to a conclusion in 1844, and it's emphasizing the covenant. Uh, both of the 2520s mark the beginning of a broken covenant. But the one for the northern kingdom that was first carried away into captivity, that, that 2,520 years of prophecy is emphasizing the trampling down. It begins in 723, ends in 1798, and right in the middle of that 2,520 years, you've got 538. So you've got the two desolating powers perfectly put into that 2,520. That's the emphasis of the, the northern kingdom's 2,520. The emphasis of the southern kingdom's 2,520, which began in 677 and it ended in 1844, has to do with the covenant itself. They broke the covenant at the beginning, but in 1844, God is going to reestablish the covenant. So when you understand that the promise of the covenant to God's people is 
Always, it's always, Moses always sets it out first. Here's the blessings if you obey. Blessing, blessing, blessing. But if you break the covenant, it's cursing, cursing, cursing. Then you realize that Israel brought the cursing upon themselves. They were promised the blessing, but they brought the cursing. And when those 2,520 years are over and the Lord's going to reinstitute the covenant with his people, what does it say? What does it say in Daniel 12, 12? Blessed is he who comes to 1843 because I'm going to reinstitute the covenant now. Not an accident. It's kind of theoretical, but it's there. Um, God brought indignation against his people because they broke the covenant. Page 83, you have a passage from Ezekiel. I poured out my indignation upon them. And it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. And the, the bottom paragraph says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their head, saith the Lord God. Did he ever find a man? To stand in the gap. Yes, he did, because he came to confirm the covenant with many for one week. <laughs> one of the things that Christ accomplished is he confirmed the covenant. He's the man that stands in the gap and confirms the covenant. But the place on this chart, if you look at the chart up here, um, right here, although you, there's no way, I can, I can barely see it standing next to it, so I know that you can't see it, but you can look up, come up in the, in the meantime, in between meetings, and look at it. The place it's referred to by the Millerites is where we're at on page 83, Leviticus 26. And uh, you see Leviticus 26 here. It starts with the blessings. This is the beginning of Levit Leviticus 26. We'll start there and then we'll drop down. It says, Ye shall make no idols or graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down to, unto it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes, keep my covenants, commandments and do them, then will I give you rain in due season. And this is where it begins. He starts telling them all the blessings that they will have if they keep the covenant. But if you turn to the next page, after he lays out all the blessings, he says, but if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint you over you terror, consumption, and burning ague, ague, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against ye, you and ye shall be slain before your enemies. I'm on page 84. That they hate you, they that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. That's verse 18. And you see down below a um, continuation. I, I need to read this one. And I will break the pride of your power and will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. I want to note that for you. Iron and bla brass are one of the symbols of the curse, okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll deal with that later. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall you, the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary to me and will not hearken to me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And then if you drop down to the bottom of the next paragraph, it says, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And then if you drop down to the bottom of the next paragraph, it says, then will I walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And then you'll notice as it continues on, in the bold face, in the passage, one of the things he says is he will scatter them. The scattering is part of this punishment. And in the next page, still talking about the cursings, top of page 85, this is still Leviticus 26. It says, if they shall confess their iniquity 
and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespasses, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I have also walked contrary to unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and then they accept of their punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob. What's this talking about? It's saying if you find yourself that you're being receiving the curse, here's the, the remedy for the curse, and who is it that is fulfilling this commandment in the Bible? It's Daniel. This is Daniel's prayer. It says, if you find yourself under the curse, it says, when you do that, if you will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with the trespasses that they trespassed against me, that's what Daniel was doing. He says, oh Lord, our father and our father's fathers, we haven't listened to the prophets. We haven't listened to you. We haven't kept your commandments. Daniel understood this is the curse of Moses. That's why he's, why he's saying it in his prayer. He's fulfilling this passage in Leviticus in his prayer. He's responding to this testimony saying, you find yourself in an enemy's land and it's obvious the Lord's indignation is poured out upon you and you've been scattered, that what you need to do is humble yourself and confess and repent. So anyway, you can't separate the curse of Moses from Dan, the book of Daniel, because that's what he's praying about in Daniel 9. He says it's his self. The curse of Moses has been brought upon us. Now, up here, you will see on the 2520, which is God's indignation, you'll see the year 677. And, you, and off to the side, though you can't see it, it says 2 Chronicles 33, 11. You have this. Um, in your notes, under Manasseh made Judah to heir, 677, James Usher's chronology. And this is the passage that the Millerites used. And the Millerites said that seven times in Leviticus 26 was identifying a time prophecy of God's indignation that would be brought against his people if they broke the covenant. A time, according to the year-day principle of which the Millerites were the expert, was a year and a Bible year has 360 days in it. So the, the punishment of the indignation in Leviticus 26 is seven times, and seven times 360 is 2,520 years. William Miller marks the carrying away into captivity of Judah. And who is Judah? Judah is the southern kingdom. He uses James Usher's chronology. Sister White had several um, books in her personal library of, that where men had listed the chronology of the Bible. They had different ideas. Different men have different chronology, chronological breakdowns of the history of the Bible. And uh, so... It, 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 she, she also had ushers, and more often than not, when you can see she's referring to um, one of the chronology that she's referring to James Ushers, and James Ushers is the one that the King James Version uses when, if you have a King James Version Bible and in, in the marginal references it has dates, it's using Ushers chronology. So both Sister White referred to that book as the the preeminent authority and the people that put the King James Bible do so also. And 677 is the year that the southern kingdom was carried away into captivity. Now, even if it says Israel here, the Millerites did not make any distinction between the southern and northern kingdom in the 2520-year time prophecy. They just did not, did not make that distinction. They assumed the 2520 was carried out when the southern kingdom was carried away into captivity, and that represented the, the curse of God. But in 1850, Hiram Edson came out with a series of articles which you have in your syllabus, incomplete. You have the whole series, where he says, not so, Miller was incorrect. The carrying away of captivity begins when the northern kingdom was carried away into captivity so Miller and the, was using Israel in a general sense, but Hiram Edson is the one that brings in the distinction between southern and northern kingdom. And in 677, it's the southern kingdom of Judah that's taken away captivity. So if you 
subtract 677 from 2520, you come to 1843. But William Miller, he mis messed up on the year zero. Um, if you take 677, um, or if you take 677, and how, how there's a way to do this, 677 BC, and you, you take it down to the year zero, and then add 1843, you come to 2520. But there is no zero. If you take 677, where William Miller really should have went is to the year one, right? And if you add 1843 onto the year one, you come to 1844. So that's one of the, I mean, this is common understanding of Adventism. This is one of the, the figures the Lord held his hand over is in the year zero with William Miller. And so, uh, at, after the Great Disappointment, pretty much this 1843 chart, was discussed, but it wasn't pushed as it had been pushed um, prior to that time period. And in 1850, you'll see at the end of this, of these sermon notes, you'll see a series of articles. In 1850, uh, the, the editor of the Review and Herald magazine, um, James White, he wrote to Hiram Edson, the man that had received the, the vision that Christ had moved from the holy place in the most holy place, and he said, Brethren Hiram, we're looking for some articles for the Review and Herald magazine. Can you send some in? So Hiram Edson put together a series concerning the scattering of Israel. And uh, you have the whole series in your, in your notes. And Hiram Edson says, no, William Miller was wrong. He says that it wasn't the southern kingdom that brought about this 2,520-year curse upon Israel. It's when the first of those two kingdoms was carried away into captivity. And the northern kingdom that is called Assyria or Samaria, Samaria was carried into captivity in 723. And when you add 2,500 to, 20, to 723 B.C., you come to 1798. So Hiram Edson makes his argument that Miller was wrong. You should have started the 2520 when the first of the two kingdoms was carried into captivity. And then if you do, what you have is you have an agreement with the, one of the foundational pioneer understandings of the books of Daniel and Revelation, and that one of those understandings that we've dealt with in the beginning is that in the book of Daniel, there are two desolating powers that are emphasized. One is paganism, one is papalism. And if you understand that this 2,520 years of indignation, this scattering is identifying when the sanctuary and the host would be trodden underfoot, Daniel 8, 13. If you start this 2,520 years of indignation in 723, it goes until 1798, and the absolute middle point for that is the year 538. So you see very clearly that you have in this time period, you have equal 1260 years of trampling down, first by paganism, then by papalism, and there's no way that that is accidental. It just doesn't work that way in God's word. But Hiram Edson said that William Miller was wrong. And Hiram Edson was wrong. Hiram Edson was right, and William Miller was right. That's the part they, they missed. If you, if you realize that, that the penalty for robbing the bank is 10 years in jail, and I rob the bank, I get 10 years in jail. And when Kathy robs the bank, she gets 10 years in jail too. The northern kingdom received 2,520 year punishment of God's indignation. And so did the southern kingdom because they had did the very same thing. Then you realize that they are both right. And they're both teaching two different things 
about God's indignation, one emphasizing the trampling down, one emphasizing the covenant. Covenant. Is that an A? I bet you that's an A. So, you see here in, in uh, 2 Kings, you see the passage where the northern kingdom is carried away in captivity that uh, Hiram Edson builds his argument on. And then if you're on page 86, let's look at a couple things here. Um, I didn't see when we started. Okay. Um, what we're saying is, let me, let me recap it one more time. Is that in Leviticus 26, God set forth among the, he, he, when he's talking about the cursings that he would bring upon his people if they broke the covenant, there were many components to that. They were going to be scattered. The heaven was going to be as iron, the earth as brass. Um, they were, they were going to be taken into captivity. Their cities were going to be besieged. They're, they're, they were going to reach a straight time where they were going to eat their children. There's so many um, specifics about what the curse would be, but also one of those specifics was is that the Lord would be, bring 2,520 years, seven times punishment upon them in his indignation. The pioneers understood this partially. Sister White is very clear in early writings when she's saying that the Lord ordained this chart she also has a passage in there where she says some of the things uh, were not seen until the Lord removed his hand. The Lord hadn't removed his hand on the, the 2520 fully in the time period of William Miller. He removed it a little bit in 1850 with Hiram Edson, um, but here recently he's allowing it to be seen that this 2520 came upon both the northern and southern kingdom, and it emphasizes two things in the book of Daniel that other themes in the book of Daniel emphasize. There, you see these two themes, the trampling down and the, the reestablishment of the covenant in other themes within the book of Daniel, which gives you a prophetic argument to say this is so. So let's, let's look at some of the themes connected with this. In Isaiah 50, verses 17 to 20, it says, Israel, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria devoured him. And last, this king of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. It's talking about the fact the king of Assyria took the northern kingdom captive and the king of Babylon took the southern kingdom captive. And I will bring Israel again into his habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfi satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days, in what days? When he's going to bring them together. In those days, and, at, and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Brothers and sisters, when is it in prophecy that the Lord removes his sin from his people in the day of atonement see there's a promise that at the end of this captivity that was delivered against the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom that the lord once again was going to bring his people together and in that time period he was going to remove sin from his people and that work began in 1844 so as Seventh-day Adventists, because we are this people that have been brought together at the end of these two periods of indignation, we need to understand these things because these things are talking about who and what we are. In Micah, I believe this is Micah, Micah 7, 7 through 20, says, Therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the Lord, the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O my en enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Micah here is illustrating someone that is bearing the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment. He's going to bear the indignation against the Lord until when? Until the judgment time. He will bring me forth to light and I shall behold his righteousness. Then shall that is mine, then she that is mine enemy shall see it and shame shall cover her which said unto me, where is the Lord thy God? My eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. God's people had been trodden down. And Micah is saying when the indignation is over in the judgment time, the enemy that has trodden us down through this indignation, first paganism, then papalism, they're going to be trodden down. The Lord's going to 
return the favor upon their head. Of course, this is what Isaiah was saying too, is that he was going to punish the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon for their work. Um, in the day thy walls are to be built, in that day shall the decree be far removed. When are the walls rebuilt? The walls are rebuilt. On October 22, 1844, Adventism takes up the spiritual work of rebuilding spiritual Jerusalem. Sister White, we have quotes. We're going to read that for you in a, in a following study. We're doing the work that Nehemiah did in rebuilding the literal temple. And this, all these themes are found, pulled together, as we understand what this indignation is talking about. In the day, October 22, 1844, that thy walls are to be built. In that day shall the decree be far, from, far removed. In that day also shall come to thee from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from fortresses even into the river and from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. This is the loud cry, latter rain time period. Notwithstanding, the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine inheritance, which dwell solitarily in the wood in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old, according to the days of thy coming up out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things, pointing back to the fact that Adventism is repeating the history of the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt and what took place when they came out of Egypt. They went to Mount Sinai and they entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord received his law, were married unto him. And this is exactly what happened to Adventism on October 22nd, 1844. And then the last passage of Micah that we're looking at on page 87 says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Brothers and sisters, this is October 22nd, 1844, the Day of Atonement. Not that it happened then, but this is what began at that time. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again and have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast away all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that this theme of God's indignation, the 2520, runs throughout the Old Testament. And what is laid out in the Old Testament is at the end of the, this punishment of God's indignation in the 1798-1844 time period that God was once again going to bring his people together. And when he brought them together, together, it was going to be the judgment time. It was going to be the time that he removed the iniquity from his people. The Millerites, if you look up here and you look in their literature, they believed that, that prophecy was confirmed upon the testimony of two. And they turned to Daniel 4 to prove the 26, Leviticus 26, seven times, the 2520. And you see on page 87 some of the verses in Daniel 4 that the Millerites would point to to show that Nebuchadnezzar seven times um, eating the grass on his hands and knees was a symbol of the 2,520 years of indignation that was carried out against the northern and southern kingdom. And we can read through this. It says, Nevertheless, this is from Daniel 4, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. Part of the punishment of Nebuchadnezzar had to do with this band of iron and brass, which is used more than once in the curse of Moses to identify what the Lord was going to bring against his people. Even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beast of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. And you'll notice if you read through the chapter that uh, the seven times punishment is mentioned four times in Daniel 4, just like it's mentioned four times in Leviticus 26. The iron and brass is mentioned more than once in the passage, which is also mentioned several times by Moses. We'll, in a moment, we'll show you what iron and brass represent according to inspiration. It's part of the punishment, and, and Daniel chapter 4 is talking about the punishment that is brought against Nebuchadnezzar because of his pride, and we're going to show you passages um, that identify that the reason that the indignation was brought against Israel because their pride. And 
Bottom of the page, Testimonies, Volume 2, page 661, it says, The Lord made a covenant with Israel that if they would obey his commandments, he would give them rain in due season. The land should yield her increase, and the trees of the field should yield their fruit. He promised that their threshing should reach unto the vintage, and the vintage unto the sowing time, and that they should eat their bread to the full and dwell in their land in safety. He would make their enemies to perish. He would not abhor them, but would walk with them and be their God, and they should be his people. But if they disregarded his requirements, he would deal with them entirely contrary to all this. His curse would rest upon them in place of his blessing. He would break the pride of power and would make the heavens over them as iron and the earth as brass. And this is what broke Nebuchadnezzar, was his pride and his power. And the Millerites point to Daniel 4 and say, this is a symbolic representation of the 2520 of Leviticus 26. This was their second testimony that they point to. Um, and on the next page, you will see a couple places where... Um, brass symbolizes affliction and iron servitude. The promise of the curse against Israel is that they were going to be afflicted and brought into bondage as servants if they broke the covenant. And of course, this was also part of the story of Nebuchadnezzar as he was brought into affliction and bondage, bondage as he lived like an animal for seven times. Um, now, upon the testimony of three, the Millerites didn't, that I know of, perhaps they did, I've never found it, did not turn to this next passage as a third witness for the 2,520 years. But if you look at Daniel um, chapter 5, where Belshazzar, Babylon is falling, you find that and we have this uh, on page 88, verses 18 through 28, you find some things that allow you to tie chapter 5 of Daniel together with chapter 4. It says, O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom. As the kingdom of Babylon is falling down around Belshazzar and the handwriting's on the wall and Belshazzar's trying to figure out what's going on, he calls in Daniel and Dan what Daniel says to him is this. The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would slew and whom he would he kept alive and whom he would set up and whom he would put down. I'm expressing that with an incorrect accent, but you all know it. But when his heart was lifted up, here we have pride, and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was, uh, was with the wild asses. They filled him with the grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou, O son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Well, the first thing Daniel says to Belshazzar is the kingdom's fallen down around him. He says, I want you to, I want the reader of these to see the connection between Belshazzar here and Nebuchadnezzar, particularly the part of Nebuchadnezzar's history when the seven times passed over him. There's a, a specific connection here in inspiration. But has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, just as Israel did, in pride, and broke the covenant. And they have brought the vessels of the house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron, wood and stone, which seest not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand is thy breath is, and who are all thy ways, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was a hand sent from him, and this is the writing, and this, and this is the writing that was written. Many, many, tekel, which is Babylonian for shekel. Euphorson or peres. It's interesting that the many tekel and Eupharsin or peris are two types of measurements. 
They are a measurement. They're a coin, and they're also a weight. And uh, you can find this source all over the place. And you have a couple of references there: Exodus 30, verse 13, and Numbers 3, verse 47, on page 89. And what those references tell us is that a shekel, which in the Babylonian is tekel, a shekel is 20 geras. This this coinage. The type of coinage that we're dealing with are geras. In the United States, the type of money we have is dollars. But in this passage, the, the point of reference that's being discussed here in Daniel 5, it's not the dollar system, it's the gera system. And a tekel or a shekel is 20 geras. The, low, the smallest division of a gera, for us, the smallest division of a dollar is what? A penny, but not so with a gera. The smallest division of a gera is you could divide it into a thousand. And a, a one thousandth of a gera is a many. And of course, we have many, many. Tekel or shekel is 20. And paras or yefarsin means divided, and it's understood as half a many, which is 500. And when you add them all up, you see the 2520 is in the story of Belshazzar, just like it's in the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, Daniel tied them both together. And what blows my mind is if you go to the weights of these, if they're, when they're used as weights in, in the trade of that time, a many was a division of 1,000, a tekel was a 20, and a paris was 500. The weights and the coinage were identical. What is the message of, that's connected with that? God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Of course, the northern kingdom was finished in 723, and it was numbered by 2,520. The southern kingdom was finished in 677 and numbered by 2,520. They were weighed in the balances and found wanting. The balances of the sanctuary, they had broken the covenant and found wanting. The kingdom is divided. The kingdom is divided between northern and southern kingdom. You can see in Daniel 8, 19, we've mentioned this as we've been going through this, trying to emphasize this. When it comes to Daniel 8, 19, and Daniel is fully aware of the curse of Moses. Daniel 8, 19, it says, And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. There are two ends of the indignation. The first end of the indignation is 1798. The northern kingdoms, 2520. The last end of the indignation is 1844. The southern kingdoms, 2520. Suddenly, Daniel 819, it's not so, such a, a difficult grammatical understanding once you understand what the indignations are and once you understand that there is a first and a last. Um, so Daniel 819 is saying, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for in 1844 the end shall be. Um, in Daniel 11:36, it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. And this is the classic verse. Most, most commentators say that this verse here is the verse that Paul uses when he's dealing with the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians. He, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When Paul is talking about the son of perdition, the man of sin, the mystery of iniquity, Bible commentators say he's, he's building those thoughts out of this verse because it is the papacy, the man of sin that exalts himself above everything it is called God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This verse is dealing with the papacy, and the last part of the verse says, the papacy shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. And the, the papacy prospered until this first indignation was accomplished. The papacy prospered until 1798. And if you notice that where it says the papacy shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished, it adds a thought. It adds one thought there. It says, for that that is determined shall be done. It says the papacy will prosper till 1798, till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined will be done. And what is it that's going to be determined? If you turn to page 91, you'll see Daniel 9, 27. And it says this. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. 
and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even to the consummation, the consummation of what? The end of the indignation. And it says, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And we've talked about the fact that the, your marginal reference will say that last word, desolate, is desolator. It's saying, for that that is determined shall be poured upon the desolator. Daniel 9, 20 is saying, 27 is saying that until the conclusion of this first indignation in 1798, in, in that time period, desolation will be poured upon the desolator. And the desolator in this time period was the papacy. And what was determined is at the end of this time period in 1798, the papacy was going to receive its deadly wound because that was what was determined. He was going to prosper until the indignation, this indignation, was accomplished in 1798. You'll notice that in the book of Daniel, therefore, the end of this first indignation is specifically identified in Daniel 9.27 to Daniel 11.36. It's talking about the papacy receiving the deadly wound at the end of this 25.20. And it points to 18.44 and Daniel 8.19 when it says, the last end of the indignation is for a time appointed. Both conclusions of these time prophecy are specifically nailed down in the book of Daniel. Um, so if you're on page 91, trying to pull some of these theories together, and, and let me share one. How, can I have a time check? 14 minutes. 14 minutes. Turn with me, if you would. This isn't in your notes. To John chapter 2. You may want to write this in your notes if you're going to test these things later. And uh, let me, chapter 2, let's start with, uh, let's start with verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that had sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten thee up. What does Sister White compare that to? We've read it here in this series. This is the first temple cleansing. She compares the first temple cleansing with the cleansing that took place during the second angel's message. Right? She compares the second temple cleansing with the cleansing that takes place in the fourth angel's message. She does it several times. When it comes to the Millerite time period, this event in the life of Christ is paralleling the 1840-44 time period when the, the purification process took place in the second angel's message. She associates it especially with the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So what? So what? Notice what it says. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou us seeing that thou doest these things? Now, if we're going to take this history and bring it into the Millerite movement, as inspiration has pointed out that this history belongs, and then the question is asked during this Millerite time period, what sign showest thou? And Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, brothers and sisters, that statement, that statement, what is that statement? That statement that Jesus right there used is the statement that the Jews used to crucify him. They were looking for a lot of ways to hang him, but this is the one they used. This is Sister White comments on it. You can read it in Desire of Ages. This, this is important stuff. What he says here, this is what gets twisted against him that opens the door so they could crucify him. And I don't know, does that have a bearing with Adventism? I suppose it does. But notice what, what the Jews say. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in, the building, in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Brothers and sisters, in this history of the cleansing of the, the temple the first time, Sister White says this is the purification 
of the Millerite time period that came right as God was raising up his temple on October 22nd, 1844. That's what's being said. And Jesus says he'd do it in, 30, in three days. In, in three days, he was going to raise up his temple. In three days, he was going to establish the covenant. If we bring that down to the Millerite time period, as inspiration does, Jesus says he's going to establish his covenant with his denominated people on October 22nd, 1844. That's why John in Revelation 10, after he's eaten the book that's sweet in his mouth and becomes bitter in his stomach, he says, you gotta, he's told you must prophesy again before many peoples, tongues, nations, and kings. And then what, what is he told to do? Go and measure the temple. October 22nd, 1844, the temple was going to be reared up. Jesus said he was going to do it in three days. But what did the Jews say? It took 46 years to raise up this temple. Brothers and sisters, what happens? How many years are between 1798, the end of the first indignation, and 1844, the end of the second indignation? 46 years. There's 46 years between here and here that the temple is getting raised up. Not an accident in scriptures. Not an accident. But more than that, brothers and sisters, I would submit to you, there is the potential that this particular subject that we're dealing with is the one that is really going to be a stumbling block for the brethren that hear this message. Why? Because this is the issue in the time period of Christ that they used to crucify him. So we may be on very, very sacred ground. So if you go back to your notes, the first indignation, 1798, the last indignation, 1844. The first indignation represents the trampling down, the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. The second indignation represents the covenant people. The covenant's broken, the covenant's reestablished. The first indignation is talking about the complete vision, the Chow's own vision. In Daniel 8, 13, the Chow's own vision, it says, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily paganism and the transgression of desolation, papalism, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? The complete vision is about the treading down, the Chow's own vision, whereas the Yulai vision, the, I mean the Mare vision, is about the singular appearance of Christ in the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844. These two visions in the book Daniel have a connection to these two 2520s. They also have a connection with the Uli vision and the Hittical vision because the Hittical vision is talking, emphasizing that the history of the trampling down is identifying the trampling down that takes place when the papacy returns to control the earth once again. And the Uli is emphasizing the work that Christ is most doing in the most holy place. The first indignation represents the scattering. The second indignation represents the gathering together that takes place. And that's why... On early writings, in early writings, page 74, it says this. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, and the efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. Here is the gathering time. In the scattering, this time period, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will heal up and bind his people. In the scatterings, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their design effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering for examples to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the were figures were as he wanted them and that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. The Lord's removing his hand from some of this chart, telling us who and what we are here at the end of the world. He's about to finish the vision, and the vision for our time period is the fact that papacy is about to return to take control of planet Earth. And there's a bloodbath ahead of us, and there's a time period where God's people are going to shine as the stars for, it, for eternity, and in the meantime, bring many to righteousness. And he's calling us into that service now, if we will see it, but we can only see it if we understand the foundations 
that he established in that time period. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we understand that it's a time that you are trying to bring your people together into a place where you can remove their sins from them and from the sanctuary and that you can have a people that perfectly reflect your character to a dying world. But in this time period, we realize that we are Laodiceans, fast asleep, and not realizing that we need this experience. And we set before you our condition and ask that you would do whatever it takes in our individual lives to awaken us to our need of the presence of Christ within and give us the courage to follow through on those actions. Please bless this information that we're putting together that it might be... Um, part of making the vision plain that those that may read it can run. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.